afternoon. Everybody awake, <laughs> excited. Uh, I'm really, I'm really delighted to be here. You know, um, a number of years ago, Abram Hoffer, who was one of my great mentors, <laughs> called me up and said, "You need to come speak at Orthomolecular." And I went that spring and presented my first paper on hormones, which was the mood biochemistry of women at midlife. <laughs> and that was a while ago. And at that meeting, I met Hugh Reardon. And I remember vividly that he gave a talk at the orthomolecular meeting in Toronto on um, medical mavericks. And I thought, this old crank, I mean, he's really funny. But, you know, I, I have the science and, you know, but in those days I was, um, I hadn't learned much about, uh, I would say, the humanitarian side of medicine. And, and uh, Hugh taught me a great deal very quickly. And he used to get in his old, I think he had an old van, and he used to drive out to Colorado and visit me and my late husband, and we would take him out to these incredible meals, and he loved to eat. <laughs> and uh, we just had wonderful times with him. And so I am thinking of those great mentors of mine today, and um, the International Society for Orthomolecular Medicine has been such a springboard for so much of what we're doing. I hope many of you will come to our spring meeting. Um, this is the work that was started by Abram Hoffer, is being continued so brilliantly by people like Dr. Lay and Ron Huntinghackey and others here. And I see so many um, wonderful faces that I've known for a long time, um, which, is, which is great. Um, Stephen Carter is uh, the chair of our wonderful International Society for Orthomolecular Medicine. He couldn't be here right now, but he'll be chairing the spring meeting. And Dr. Yanagasawa is the uh, president of the International Society for Orthomolecular Medicine, and he is here. So I just wanted to introduce you to some of my, you know, my mentors. So my work, and I think it really speaks to what this kind of wonderful medicine is about, for me, it's about bringing the science back to medicine, if it ever was there in the first place, I'm not sure. Um, because if you look at the history of how certain discourses got started, they really were not very scientific. And there are great doctors, and then there are other doctors. And um, we all know, we, you know, we all know both types. But essentially, um, my work deals with the fact that these hormones that I study are the foundational molecules of aging well. And I'm going to focus today on the gender hormones for women. You're going to hear a lot about progesterone, which I did the seminal research in years ago now on the distinction between synthetic and bioidentical. And um, you're going to hear a lot about estrogen, and you're going to hear a lot about receptors. And I'm going to weave that into the mood stuff. It's not just dry chemistry. Because the mood is really the focus, because women live largely in our relational, emotional worlds. And while good science can be counterintuitive, I mean, I may not like what a molecule looks like, but I have to include that in the discourse or the numbers or whatever. But ultimately, the purpose of this work is to help women trust their deepest intuition as they get older, to trust themselves. And I really believe when these molecules are missing, it's a lot harder to do that. Um, so invariably, when I give a talk like this, at the end, somebody will say, well, you didn't address such and such. So this is my talk, and I'm going to address what I'm going to address. And then, <laughs> do you have a different talk? <laughs> That's fine, but today is my talk, so I'm not going to address everything. Tomorrow in the breakout session, 
Um, my wonderful colleague, um, Carol Peterson, is here uh, from the Women's International Pharmacy. It's a great compounding pharmacy. Of course, there are many, but that happens to be a particularly wonderful one. And um, Carol's going to work with me in the breakout session. And she's going to talk more on um, thyroid. She's very knowledgeable. Um, and we're both going to talk on testosterone. I'm going to tell you something riveting about the testosterone receptor at the end of my talk today, and that'll open up the discourse for tomorrow. And tomorrow, I'm also going to talk about um, some work we're doing with um, adrenal dysfunction and natural hydrocortisone. So we'll get into a lot more of that stuff tomorrow. So in case I don't address your particular um, concern today. Um, so my first slide, I want to speak to getting women out of the addiction to perfection as we age. I think it's really important to surrender to the aging process and to life in general and trying to hold on to a certain perception of how things should be uh, makes a lot of women uh, that I see ill. Um, and some of the women I'm seeing, because we ha I, I'm mainly a researcher, but we also have a clinical practice, and my physician partner and I see women from all over the world. So a lot of these women um, are really in, in big life crises, and they've been all over, and we find that by getting their hormones balanced, they have a much better opportunity to move through the you know, vicissitudes of, of life. Um, I don't know what happened to my color. Ron, it's supposed to be a color slide, do you know? Uh, oh, oh, okay, it was really pretty, I had molecules. It's okay, um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's okay. Um, Jeffrey Dash is a wonderful uh, hormone doctor in Florida, and he and I uh, collaborate on different things. Um, and what he says is that it's medical malpractice when doctors prescribe antidepressant SSRI type drugs when women are actually exhibiting every sign of an estrogen deficiency. So when my book got published, uh, there was an FDA advisory panel saying that the FDA should not approve this new drug, Brisdale, which was just an, a patented form of Paxil, only they were marketing toward menopausal women for the same things that they would prescribe Paxil. And even though it was recommended not to advise for it, they approved it such as the FDA, <laughs> often. Um, and the reason this is so important is because we are such a, a drug-infused culture, and so many of the symptoms women have are, are frankly hormone deficit or imbalance symptoms. And as women get older, and this is true for men too, and we'll address more of that tomorrow with Carol, but as we get older and life's challenges often get steeper, one of the things we need to recognize is that there is no set fixed dose of these molecules. We, we have done years of research and the N of one studies that every woman is an individual case speaks to how these molecules best work. So. Uh, to say that there is a definitive dose is, is simply untrue. And the drug advertising, you know, people think you can be happy all the time if you manipulate the serotonin receptors in the brain, but um, there's, there's actually no significant data that says that serotonin will actually be the key to... Um, curing depression. There are certain links to how serotonin impacts certain pathways that affect mood, but there's a whole industry based on serotonin reuptake drugs. These are some of the key signs of estrogen deficiency. 
And, you know, they're very significant symptoms, and a lot of women really suffer um, when they are in estrogen deficiency, just like they suffer when they're in magnesium deficiency or vitamin C deficiency. They're all different aspects. This is a whole um, puzzle that we're trying to put together, but this is what I work in. Um, so what's fascinating in my work is that the receptors are very significant for hormones. And that's why, for example, herbs that have some modulating effects on female hormonal symptoms are not really effective on correcting specific symptomology because they're crude molecules and you need to target the exact molecule to the exact receptor. So when you don't have enough of the uh, molecules to make TPH2, tryptophan hydroxylase, then you can't convert uh, all these supplements like HTP and tryptophan, you can't convert them to serotonin if you are estrogen deficient. Now, there are certain cofactors that may facilitate that process, so men may benefit even with lower hormonal uh, levels in women that manufacture these enzymes, but this is significant, the dance between the neurotransmitters and the neurosteroids, and I'll get more into that when we talk about anxiety later in the GABA A receptor. We don't use saliva tests, um, and um, I, I, I'm not here not to offend anybody, and they have their use for certain things, like cortisol levels and forensics, but for gender hormones, I've looked at hundreds of them, and I have found them worthless, because I think they were invented as an argument to maintain a perception of estrogen dominance in women, that's my own take on them, take it or leave it. We use blood because it's a gold standard in the research world, and even the urine tests I find lacking. Um, these urine strip tests have come out, but they're not much better than saliva. For me, they're kind of a watery average. We really need to see what's going on. And 70% of the hormone in your blood is loosely bound to albumin. That makes it available to dock at the receptors, very easy to dislodge. So if you're only measuring the free hormone, you, you just don't have any idea of what you're measuring. I mean, it's helpful to look at it for certain aspects. Free testosterone is helpful to look at in the blood or you know, in saliva, perhaps. But basically, we know that there's all this hormone circulating that 70% of it is going to dock and the receptors are going to pick it up. Just more on that. We use estriol in all our compounding because it is a very safe molecule and it's bioprotective. And the significance of estriol is very, um, very much coming to light. There was an old Department of Defense study that's being recirculated about how important it is to confer protection. If you have high estriol levels when you're younger, your chances of getting breast cancer when you're older are significantly lowered. But that has a lot to do with um, the receptors that um, are affected by changes in estrogen patterns. So for example, as women get older, their FSH and their luteinizing hormone, the follicular stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone rise. And, and that's because your body is desperately trying to make more estrogen. Um, and it's kind of like thyroid. So when your TSH goes high, your body's trying to make more thyroid. But with these molecules, what happens is that there are three estrogens, E1, E2, and E3, three primary estrogens. There are many side chain estrogens. But E1 rises because our fat cells are churning it out in E2. So E1, est estrone, rises and estradiol drops 
And that's when the brain fog and the first signs of depression set in for many, many women. This flat affect depression is the most presented symptom at our office, that women have just lost their mojo, their joie de vivre. Mojo we'll get to with testosterone too, but this kind of brain <laughs> energy just goes away when you don't have E2. Now, we find that a lot of women don't respond to low-dose hormones, and we don't mega-dose. We're not talking life extension doses. But we have to use enough to correlate with correcting the symptom that is presented. And so if a woman needs more than a standard perception of a low dose, the important thing is to buffer that with other things that I will get into that inhibit the tendency of E1 to become aggressive when it is allowed to circulate in the blood freely. I mean, we produce it anyway. The critical thing here is to have enough E2 to compensate for what E1 is trying to do. This is the estrogen receptor alpha. This is the main receptor for estrogen. This is where all the good things happen and all the bad things happen. It's a beautiful receptor. Oh, there's color, so I wanted you to see it. Um, it's really beautiful, and it has many aspects to it that allow estrogen to, uh, to work the way it's supposed to. That's, this is the primary docking site for 17-beta estradiol. But, <coughs> excuse me, it's also the estrogen that can mutate. And I will address later how some of the current research is so exciting in terms of blocking the tendency of E2 to do that. But for, for our purposes right now, um, what you need to know is that E2 is successfully mediated by progesterone and testosterone. So, so when there is a dance between primary estrogen and progesterone, the hormones have much less of a capacity to um, become aggressive. Now, here's the critical thing. When we're working with women, we can't wait for 20 years for all the women that we're being asked to help until we have absolutely conclusive data. We have to have a logical perception that stands on the shoulders of great science. So, thus, at the beginning of my talk, when I talked about some of my heroes in science, I stand on their shoulders and on, and on a number of others. And my leading scientific colleague is Dwight Smith, who is the former uh, chair of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Denver. And I'll show you the molecules in a little while that we have been working on for years. And unlike the millennials today who think that everything started and ends with them, <laughs> I'm around millennials a lot, and they, they don't understand you know, history. I'm speaking broadly. But this scientific discourse is based on years and years and years of observational data and theoretical data and clinical data. So in order for us to help women, we, we can't have endless uh, years with the FDA waiting approval for molecules that are bioidentical because they're not going to give it anyway. And that's, that's the dilemma in working with bioidentical hormones is that you're not coming out with a new drug. You are working to defend the molecules that should be defended. The soy phytoestrogens, this is very important. There's a lot of misperception about soy. Um, fermented soy has tremendous anti-carcinogenic properties, fermented soy. And the reason is because of the three beta um, estrogen receptor. This is tied into the beta adiol receptor where these molecules 
land. It's connected to the estrogen, rece estrogen receptor beta. Um, and this is very important because when there's enough activity at the beta receptors, there are less opportunities for aggressive estrogens to gain a foothold. So we are not anti-soy. A lot of the anti-soy information um, was put out by the dairy lobby. Go figure. Um, I'm not saying soy everything, but fermented traditional soy uh, is very important food for women. Uh, I mean organic, non-GMO, good tofu, fermented miso, tamari, and iodine. This is why Asian women who eat a lot of those foods have the lowest gender cancer rates in the world until they start eating a Western diet. And it's the iodine and the fermented soy affecting the beta, beta allele, allele receptors. Um, so these are the three estrogens I want to talk about, reduction and oxidation. Uh, we've been studying this for years, and uh, it, it's really vividly true with the estrogen spectra how important um, electron transfer is in terms of where the least aggressive estrogens show up is where there is reduction chemistry. So it ties into what you guys have been teaching me um, about redux. I mean, we've been studying redux for years. Um, but in the, in the construct that I work in, we look at the three estrogens, and on the, on the side of your screen that's called the, this is called the, um, the benzene ring side. See, the stability is all there. There's no change. But on the right, you have the E1 on the top. That's estrone. That's the most aggressive estrogen. And this guy is really the danger because that double bonded oxygen is what I'm going to talk about right now. This is the mischief maker because when this eat this this here um, breaks apart in the process of hydrolysis, you really have a continuous uh, redux effect going on with the estrogens. But the first step is you go from E1 to E2, and then you can go in another pathway from E1 to E3. But E1, when that double bonded oxygen breaks apart, what happens is there's a reduction, and then you form the OH on E2, and that is a much healthier molecule. So there's the redux there. And then you go into an oxidative state to E3, which is a bioactively inactive molecule. So this is constantly a sequence that is happening in the presence of hydration. So water allows the reaction to proceed. So what we've been doing is looking at what distinguishes these molecules. And in the estrogen spectra, which I've been studying for years, that double bonded oxygen um, is what that peak is at 1720. And that shows the presence of that double bonded oxygen that's unique to E1. Now, why is that important? Well, it's terribly important because when you have that double bonded structure, um, I'll show you again, that 16 alpha hydroxyl group is the precursor to the relatively inactive E3 estriol. This does not make estriol toxic. It's like you can have bad parents and have a good kid sometimes. Um, <coughs> But the unique spacing of the 16 alpha hydroxyl group on that OH group, this is really important because the OH in the transition down to E3 forms an extreme, extremely stable molecule. It forms an extreme, extremely stable structure, and that's not good. So E1 becomes very stable before it breaks to transition to E3. And in that pathway, the toxic metabolites, because of the stability of that OH group anchoring the molecule, 
those toxic metabolites can stay in the body for days instead of hours, and we think that's where some of the aggression happens. So it's the conferring stability. A lot of times in pharmacology, you see molecules used as anchoring molecules, but this happens naturally. And so how do you get, that, get rid of that E1? Years ago when they first started using Triest, I think developed by Jonathan Wright originally, they were using E1, E2, and E3. And then they left out E1 when they realized how aggressive it was. Now we only use E2 and E3. Uh, originally, I'm not sure if it was Jonathan Wright or someone else, but he was one of the early ones. When it would just seem natural, put all three estrogens in there, but you don't want E1. E1's the one that becomes aggressive. And without estrogen, the ionic channels become excitatory very readily. So to create stability in those channels, um, you need that E2-mediated neuroprotection. Now, this is, this is um, the thermodynamics and the kinetics that we're working on now. And the thermodynamic aspects of the estrogens has to do with the theoretical way that the molecules actually transition. But the kinetics overrule the thermodynamics, and this is where it gets fascinating in that we could have a redux reaction, but if molecularly the kinetics are driving the reaction forward, that will overrule the thermodynamics, and that's the way physical chemistry works, and the colleagues I work with on this are physical chemists, and I really see that the redux can take it to a certain point, but the kinetics are going to drive the reaction if a pathway is available, the kinetics will drive that reaction, and that is experimentally validatable, whereas the thermodynamics are theoretical. Um, now, I'm going to go into some of the theory that's out there about, about bioidenticals for a moment. So the Cleveland Clinic came out with a paper last year saying that Bioidentical hormones were essentially uh, not important. And, at, and that was really funny because at the same time, there were several other papers that came out talking about the wondrous capacity of bioidenticals. Um, and it was disappointing, but not unexpected, that a clinic such as the Cleveland Clinic could not be looking at the science, but they were not. And at the University of Texas Health Science Center, it was documented studying, I think it was 296 women, um, felt profoundly better, and the data really showed that they had far less mood issues and generally felt significantly better on bioidentical hormones. This is a very important paper um, published in gra Graduate Medicine Review in 2009. It's still the gold standard for reviewing bioidentical hormone data. There are 196 medical and scientific references in this paper. Uh, Ken Holtorf found that the molecular structures of bioidentical hormones are so significant and the data for progesterone, not to have the risk for breast cancer uh, that synthetic progestins do is uh, the most important aspect. And that's, that's connected to my original research, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Progestins, progestins are not progesterone. Progestins are synthetic molecules with a monster side chain. They're altered to be patentable by the drug companies, and anything that doesn't sound like progesterone is not progesterone. But the problem is, in the medical literature, 
you'd have to run an entire program through PubMed to correct all the times that articles use them interchangeably. So people who are knowledgeable about hormones know that often the words may not totally explain what you're looking at. Does that make sense? And then pharmaceutical ghostwriting. It's a huge thing in, uh, in gynecology journals today and in psychotropic journals, psychotropic medicine. I think it's creeping up in other areas of medicine, but there are companies like Design Right and Pharma Right that are hired to ghostwrite articles using physician names and doctors put their names at the top of a paper. I started reading a paper, and why? It's your guess is, you know, as good as mine, but um, I think there are probably some um, exchanges involved in why this gets done, and I have no, uh, no direct knowledge of how this exact paper got written, but I started reading it, and I couldn't believe it. It was... And then I realized it had been ghostwritten. So a doctor at the University of Pennsylvania, which is not a bad medical school, he ghostwrote with far pharma right and design right a paper called Bioidentical Hormone Therapy, a review of the evidence. Uh, and his conclusion was that if it's not big pharma, then it's not good. And so... The abstract was bizarre enough. I started reading the paper. And what he was doing, this is incredible. A drug company had just come out with the pharmaceutical in Juvia. And Juvia is made from plants. And <coughs> Dr. Cerigliano said it mi it's designed, it was designed to mimic Premarin. And therefore, because it's made from plants, but it mimics Premarin, it's a bioidentical um, hormone because it's made from plants, which real bioidentical hormones are. But the conferring of bioidentical status has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the exact molecule that's in the body. So in other words, I don't care if it's grown on a shrub or synthesized in the lab, vitamin C is vitamin C. You may have different delivery methods and all of that, but the molecule itself, is that correct, Ron? <laughs> Guys, <laughs> so, so to, have, to be bioidentical, it has to be the exact molecule. And almost 50 years ago, the drug companies were told that women need a synthesized progesterone in order to be able to continue taking estrogen. And that's when the drug companies started doing a lot of mischief because they wouldn't just say, well, women need progesterone, what's the problem? No, that couldn't be patented. You can't patent a biological molecule. There's something in the legal code with pharmaceuticals where it's very distortive. And so what they could do is just change it a little bit. Just put a little side chain. And it has played such havoc with women's health ever since. And Newsweek has really been a problem source for a lot of this. Um, unregulated, not at all. Th this the hormones themselves are, are absolutely regulated. They're the same molecules that are used in every hospital pharmacy in the country is a compounding pharmacy. Um, the difference is, and why they get away with saying things like this, is that with individual women, every dose is unique. So if one woman needs four milligrams of estradiol and one only needs 0 0.75, that's unregulated because that's up to her doctor. Now, Jeffrey Dash, my great colleague in Florida, he, um, he and I had a lot of fun when this came out on um, PubMed. 
on Medscape because the Endocrine Society, which used to be one of these august academic societies, is now just a commercially driven society. And they tried to inhibit compounding pharmacies last year. They said that um, in the spring that um, they didn't advocate compounding. And when we went out online to comment, there were so many doctors who had called them on their nonsense. I couldn't believe it. Usually, there were, in the past, it might have been a handful saying, you're wrong. There were probably 60 saying, that's garbage. And, um, and very good reasons for saying that. So I, I was gratified to see that. And of course, I contributed. And, and Jeffrey Dash um, and I had a lot of fun with that because I just said, if you're interested, the science is there. And of course, they usually ignore such challenges. Um, again, medicine and science are not the same thing. The synthetic progestins increase the conversion of weaker endogenous estrogens in, into more potent estrogens. This is the danger with synthetic progestins. They actually make your own estrogen more aggressive. And when I was hiking up Aspen Mountain last weekend, I actually had an aha moment about why, and I'm going to tell you about that toward the end and it connects to this whole premise about the damage that progestins do, but I'm saving that. But the reason is terribly important. But real progesterone has an opposite effect. Now, this is the original research that I did at the University of Denver. We did th this, is lo this was looking at structural chemistry, and this is my, this is my passion, is understanding what the molecules actually do. I like to say I'm a, <laughs> I'm a scientist and a ski bum. <laughs> and I, I lived in Colorado all these years. I'm a passionate skier. And that's I do a lot of my best work when I'm on the mountain because I actually really think about things in a different, you know, different place. And um, these molecules absolutely are riveting. Um, so Dwight Smith and I did this at the University of Denver years ago, and we've been working on it ever since. And he is an absolutely extraordinary physical chemist, and he's guided me for, for years. And um, what, what you're seeing here is this water peak at 3,400. And this only shows up with synthetic progestins. Why is this significant? Because women feel horrible on synthetic progestins, and they are the basis of all the birth control pills, all the hormone replacement therapy that most women have been subjected to. And the Women's Health Initiative had two arms. One had women just on Premarin, and one had women on Prempro, Premarin and Provera. It was the arm with Prempro that had all the negative data, aside from the fact that it was a very flawed study because they started with a, um, a demographic of women who were not healthy anyway. It was a flawed study using flawed molecules. And even though I don't like Premarin, that wasn't the problem. I don't like Premarin because it's mostly E1, but it's the progestins that are caused. It's the biggest problem in women's health today. And they still won't talk about it. They just keep making the same bad molecules in lower and lower doses. So it's unbelievable. The science is there. I've been part of it for all these years. And they just act like you're crazy if you try to introduce it at places like the Endocrine Society. But I'm not crazy. They're crazy. And they don't want to look at the molecules. They want to support the agenda of Wyeth, Pfizer, whatever to advocate for the fact that if it's not a, an invented pharmaceutical, then it can't be um, optimal. So the synthetic progestins are the culprit. And when we figured this out, 
at the same time we looked at real progesterone, there's no water peak. And that water peak here is why women feel so bad on Provera, Medroxy, progesterone, acetate, um, because they retain water like crazy. Um, it's an extremely hydrophilic molecule, the synthetic. And real progesterone is a diuretic. So when women retain water, they're retaining it in their brains too, and they're foggy and they don't feel good and they act weird too. Often it really affects behavior. But when we were doing this research, and this is Fourier transform infrared spectra where you're looking at the functional dominant molecules in a, in a structure. When we were doing this and we got terribly excited about it, at the same time, and often that happens in science is a synchronicity in a totally unrelated different study at the Oregon Regional Primate Lab, um, a scientist named Kent Hermsmeyer was doing a study with rhesus monkeys and he uh, was looking at the vascular function of estrogen. And when the monkeys just got pure estradiol, E2, their cardiac function improved. They had better vascular dilation. And then he wanted to see, he divided the monkeys into two different groups. Just to, he had no forethought that anything different would show up. He just wanted to make sure that using a little medroxy progesterone acetate, Provera, would be okay. And so one group of monkeys were injected with, the, uh, they were all injected with the drug that could induce cardiac spasms. The monkeys that then got the synthetic progestin as distinct from the monkeys that got real progesterone, the, the difference was uh, life-threatening. The monkeys that got real progesterone, there was no change in the efficacy of the estradiol. The monkeys that got the synthetic progestin went into such severe coronary spasms, the study had to be stopped. That was in 1997. It was reported in scientific journals, it was on Science News Online, it was in one medical journal. They completely ignored the evidence and kept giving women Provera. And they continue to do so. So I've been involved in this since the start. And the huge distinctions, um, the opposite impact on the oxidative isoforms and the conversion of potent estrogens to their least potent um, counterparts that happens with real progesterone. So estrogen is most important for cognition, but progesterone is most important for anti-anxiety aspects. And this is really fascinating. And this has to do with the way natural progesterone interfaces with the GABA-A receptor. Oral progesterone I don't like as well. Uh, we use transdermal creams. That's my favorite delivery method. Oral progesterone, such as Prometrium or compounded, goes through the liver first pass. And even though it's bioidentical, <coughs> it impacts the GABA receptors in a much more potent, really a drug-like manner. So women who are vulnerable to depression do, t do not do well on oral progesterone, even if it may help some women sleep at night. There's one doctor saying it may have more breast protection than transdermal. We don't, in my circle, see any evidence for that. Um, dosing, just like with vitamin C, you have to have enough for that particular situation. Um, what happens when you swallow progesterone, even if it's transdermal, is a, a, a metabolite forms in the upper GI called 5-alpha-pregnandione. 
And that's a first cousin to phenobarbital. And I've been saying this for years, that's why I don't like oral progesterone, because women who are vulnerable to flat depression get worse the next morning. Um, so I really prefer transdermal for that reason alone, and, and there are times when it might be okay to use oral progesterone, but never, um, obviously never synthetic. Now the GABA receptor is something I've studied for years, and um, it ties into this whole neurosteroid neurotransmitter thing with, um, this is the GABA-A receptor, and um, we can talk more about this tomorrow, but essentially, if you don't have the metabolite from progesterone called allopregnanolone, then that alpha, the alpha-4 subunit on the GABA receptor, and there's the GABA-A um, receptor right there, the alpha-4 subunit on, on the GABA-A receptor. And this subunit, if there's no metabolite of progesterone, can become excitatory instead of inhibitory. So there's the dance of the hormone again with the neurotransmitter. GABA is an amazing molecule, but it's activated by allopregnanolone to have that dampening, calming effect. And we use GABA with progesterone for anxiety. I'm not a big fan of uh, pharma GABA, this lower dose chewable GABA. Uh, some women have told me they feel more, shall we say, stoned than calm. But that's personal choice. We use, um, we use pure crystalline GABA. We can talk about that in the breakout session. But if somebody's having a panic attack, men or women, <coughs> excuse me, and they rub just a little, like 50 milligrams of progesterone in their wrist, it'll stop a panic attack. And the combination, progesterone alone will do that most of the time. The, c the combination with with GABA is extraordinary. And here's that again. Cheryl Smith at um, S uh, State University of New York at SUNY, um, at Stony Brook, um, has done wonderful work on this receptor. And GABA depolarizes the neurons. It opens the receptor and it mimics the hydration sphere. Um, it, it, the chloride ions work like, like water. They just flow through, and by opening that channel, that creates neuroinhibition. GABA is the most abundant neurotransmitter in the human body, but people who are vulnerable to anxiety either don't have enough or don't have the transport mechanisms. And that's enough on that. Okay, I'm going to finish just by, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on testosterone because I think we're running out of time. Am I right? Okay, um, so testosterone we're going to get into more in the breakout session, but I want to tell you a couple of things. This is the hormone of self-esteem for women, and women can be exquisitely sensitive to it, and we, we build it up incrementally, and it's obviously the missing thing when a woman has lost her mojo, psychically, physically, every way, so it helps us restore that essential, uh, that essential energy, <laughs> cosmic energy. It is not the hormone of femininity, that is estradiol, but it is a balancing molecule. However, testosterone in both men and women is the most important anti-cancer molecule being researched in hormones today. And this is true in men and women. And this is what I want to kind of leave you with that I um, uh, inferred earlier. If, as men get older, what happens is it's the aggressive estrogens that can start to take over because testosterone aromatizes Men lose their testosterone, they get breasty. You know when you know some old son of a gun, all of a sudden he be, well, all of a sudden, over time he becomes very sweet and sort of sentimental. And look at his body. He's gotten often soft, breasty. That's because the testosterone has aromatized and there's more estrogen present than there used to be.
And that's not a good place to be. With women, if you don't have enough testosterone, you're also at risk because you're constantly aromatizing estrogens into more aggressive forms. Now, progesterone is a natural aromatase inhibitor, and it's, you don't need drug aromatase inhibitors if you're using progesterone. And aromatase inhibitors have side effects, and they're drugs, and they can be useful. We, my partner doesn't believe in using them most of the time, and some of the best doctors that I've worked with use progesterone. And I'm not a specialist on men, but I know chemistry, and it makes sense to me thus far. Now, what happens is that synthetic progestin blocks the pathway that allows testosterone to get to its receptor. And that is the critical danger that I was thinking about last weekend. It's not my original work, but I put a lot of pieces together. And it's the blocking the pathway to allow testosterone to get to its receptor that makes progestin so potentially carcinogenic. Because testosterone has this astounding capacity to inhibit mutations in the hormonal sequences. So I'm going to end there, and uh, we'll talk more at the breakout tomorrow. Thank you. You want me to answer that first? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good idea to look at it. I do. Okay. Um, I do, initially. SHBG, sex, sex hormone, hormone binding globulin. Yeah. It's a good idea to have an awareness of how much is circulating. But I think there's becoming too much micromanagement in hormones. Ah. And I think the more we simplify, um, and the, the good science becomes more and more visible, we don't need to micromanage every aspect of this because the, the most important data is what you need to focus on. Yeah. Do, uh, gender, do, do people develop gender hormone resistance? You've heard of insulin resistance and thyroid hormone resistance. Do you think there's a, such a creature as gender hormone resistance? No. No. Okay. I, and I'm going to say what I think is that if you look at the fact that very few pregnant women develop any kind of gender cancer. It's mostly women who are postmenopausal, and you look at their hormone levels and they're in the gutter. And I'm not saying everybody has to take hormones, but I'm saying that look at the data. I mean, we can't say to a woman, if you use bioidentical hormones, you could never get cancer. That would be a lie. One in eight women today, and I think it's even lower now, are getting some kind of gender cancer. Yeah. But our working hypothesis is that by conferring some autonomy over a system, meaning the human body, you're actually creating less vulnerability to the molecular entropy that occurs in all these reactions. Okay. Two more questions here. Uh, your thoughts on the, birth, on the bioidentical hormone replacement therapy pellets, intradermal pellets. Glad you asked. <laughs> I don't like them. Um, for, I don't like them because to me they're not a natural way to use hormones. I think they're a good way for doctors to make more money. I don't like them for two reasons, and that, that's not totally fair to say that every doctor using them is just looking to make more money. Some doctors really find them more convenient. I don't see the purpose of inserting these pellets near the vulnerable pelvic organs, even though they're bioidentical. Furthermore, what you're not told is that for a couple of weeks, people feel great. Everything's just hunky-dory. And then they start to dive off. And they start to, in some people, it happens more precipitously. It's Most people, it's a little bit of a gradual decline. But the point is, you can't do anything about it until it's time to go back in and have them change. When we use transdermal creams, I have people adjusting their estrogen when they're depressed. They may 
need a lot more estradiol than the woman next to them. And this is something very, very important. When women are going through high stress, their, their primary estradiol levels are diving. They use so much more of the hormone. And I have, we have older women. Most of the women we see are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, over 45. That's our practice. We have women who don't feel good until they get enough estradiol. They just don't feel good. They don't get out of that depression. And that's my objection to some of the low dosing that I've seen out there, even by people I have great regard for in other ways. Um, with their work, they're not giving enough. And if you don't give enough, the brain reactions don't proceed. And it has, I think it has a lot to do with the electron transfer, too. You don't get that E2 impact. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. There's one other question here, and I would, the, the, the person who submitted about the 34-year-old mother of five that stopping her periods. Could you just come up and, and talk later because we've got to go on to the next thing. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Phyllis. <laughs>